Okay. Sure. Our mission, Helping Parents Heal, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. However, these Zoom meetings are helpful to parents all around the world and they are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members who are not able to attend this meeting live can also watch. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, and I'm thrilled that you're here. I, I wanted to first say that um, we're thrilled to have Suzanne helping us. Um, she is a huge part of Helping Parents Heal. She asked that I did not read her bio because it would take too much time, but I think that most of you here already know about her. If you'd like to know more, she's the messenger of hope. Please go to www.suzanneheisman.com. I'll put that in the chat box. Also, at the end of the meeting, Suzanne is going to be drawing the names of 10 lucky winners of the, uh, the drawing that we have for the different recommendations that went up onto the Helping Parents Heal book site on Amazon. So um, we'll be giving out two free books to 10 different people who are drawn this evening. That'll go on at the end of the meeting. So please stay on until she's able to do so. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to beautiful Suzanne Giesman with great thanks and gratitude. Thank you, Elizabeth and Irene. And uh, you failed to mention that I'm gonna be interviewing both of those lovely ladies tomorrow live on my Messages of Hope radio show. There's a link to that on my Facebook page, also on the radio show page of my website. So if you can't join us live, that will also be available through all the normal radio channels afterwards. So it's such an honor to moderate this discussion this evening as we were chatting with those who are going to be speaking this evening beforehand, it just opens my heart wide to see uh, these parents who most of them I have met, some I haven't met in person, but I feel that I know them in my heart. This evening is about a book that they're all featured in. Hopefully most of you have read it by now. If not, you're gonna to wanna to read it after tonight. Look at my copy, it has a few little notes in it. This is based on Craig McMahon's documentary by the same name, but it's far different than the documentary. As Paul Harvey, who some of you are old enough to know the name, used to say, this tells the rest of the story. And that's what's so beautiful, told in the words of each parent. And why would you want to read stories after story after story of parents who've gone through the same thing you have? Well, for that very reason to know that healing is possible. The lessons in this book are tremendous. So when Elizabeth and Irene asked me to moderate this, I thought, my goodness, we only have about an hour. What kind of questions could I ask from each person? I'd have to ask the same question or how's it gonna go? I didn't know until just a couple days ago and I'm on a bike ride and when your mind wanders, that's when your loved ones can really get in, when you're not focused on a task and suddenly I felt the kids around me and they said, we'll show you what to ask. Go back to the book, review every chapter and each of us will show you in the chapter what we want our parents to talk about. I loved that they gave me guidance. And so that's exactly what I did over the last two days. And as I would look at each chapter, I tuned into each one of 
the children mentioned there. And as I read through, they snagged me with a certain topic. And you'll see how brilliant the kids are working as a group because each one focuses on a little bit of a different twist of things that all of you will benefit from. Not quite the same topic every time, not just the great signs, but each one filled with a lesson. So just know that all of our kids are always around when we hold meetings like this. And this special group of parents in this book, their kids designed this evening. So let's just jump right in. Gonna to, going to go through the chapters in order. And we be, begin with Elizabeth Boisson and her son Morgan and her daughter Chelsea. As I reviewed the chapter, we can bring Elizabeth in. Morgan said, tell them about the rock. And I know that you'll know what the rock is, Elizabeth. Tell that story, please. Oh, I would love to. That's one of my favorite stories. And obviously, um, when Morgan passed at the base camp of Mount Everest in Tibet, it was the most devastating day of my life. But um, what was amazing is that immediately after, I um, was connected with Suzanne Wilson, who was doing a reading for me at a yoga studio. I had no idea that this was going on. I was at home. The owner of the yoga studio was asking Suzanne to prove that she had abilities. She didn't believe in any of this. And um, she came through with so many incredible val validations. But one of the most incredible validations was that I was going to be receiving a rock from the place that Morgan passed. And this rock was going to be broken in half. And Suzanne Wilson drew it on a piece of paper to show to Angie and ultimately to show to me. Well, I got this and I said, oh, this is nice. Although all of the other validations were incredible. But so what about the rock? And then in December, two months later, we had the visit from Colin, which was Morgan's roommate. And he came all the way to Cave Creek with that rock. And he gave it to us and it looked exactly like the rock in the picture. So that was an incredible story. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. I just love that. And it shows what all of us can come to know that our kids have the bigger picture, the greater perspective, and could see that coming and gave that to Suzanne Wilson in her mind to, to share. Where do you have that rock now, Elizabeth? It's in Morgan's bedroom, but um, I, I'm not really sure. I'd like to have it in a more prominent place, but we have it with his ashes. We have, um, Someday we're going to do something with this bedroom. For now, we love having it the way that it is. And I think that it all depends on how the parents want to do. It's been almost 13 years, 12 years now since he passed, but everything is the same in his room. So that rock is there. <laughs> it's beautiful. I know with so many readings I do, the kids across the veil show that, that shrine, that special area that the parents have in the home. They they know if the room is intact or if it's not. And I want to tell you all, it doesn't matter to them if you've moved things. Just knowing that they're there with us, that's what matters to them. They love that we keep them alive in our hearts. So uh, that's beautiful. And I love when they show what's on those special altars. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. All right, Carol Allen. You want to say hi so we make sure you we have you here. Hi everyone. There we Thanks go. Thanks for having me. Yes, <clears throat> indeed. So we're gonna bring up your page here. So your beautiful son Tyler across the veil. He snagged me with the fact that both of you at the soul level knew before he passed somehow that he might not spend what we consider a full life here. Why don't you share that with us? Absolutely, that's very true. I always worried about Tyler. Uh, I don't mind worried about both my kids, but I literally have visions of funerals. I lost one son, I lost um, one friend in high school. And I would think back to him. And I remember when Tyler graduated, because I had this vision that it would happen in high school. And I would always just push it away and think, 
no, the, the, I'm just, you know, overprotective, paranoid, but I would literally see a visions of a funeral and it was, it was of him and I would push it away. And then he actually made a comment at one time, which was kind of strange. He said, um, he, you know, there was a little gal that he started to see. And I said to him, well, what do you think? And he basically said, I just don't know if I want her to be my last girlfriend. And of course, at the time I said to him, your last girlfriend. And I said, you're 19, you know, what do you mean? You think you have to marry her? And he immediately looked at me. It, I, I, I thought of this, of course, after he had passed, all these visions come back to me, but he looked at me and he said, yeah, that was a weird thing to say, huh, mom? I'm only 19. But um, I just, and my husband as well, uh, a week a week before Tyler's accident, my husband was outside every night sitting by himself at the fireplace. And he said to me, I just kept seeing a funeral and I assumed it was me. He said, I thought I was dying. And I, you know, for years, I thought I was dying. I was having these reoccurring nightmares, which uh, I believe it was just my soul couldn't handle a nightmare of him. So it was me that I kept seeing it just death. But anyway, but I know I, I believe with everything in me that that we have a soul contract and that's why I felt it. And that's why he felt it. And we see this in several of the chapters, how several of the parents who wrote their stories had the same kind of feeling. Have you discussed that with others? Carol? Uh, uh, yes, I have. I have discussed it with, uh, you know, because I've been in the group and have so many friends here. And, and I've talked to a lot of friends who have said that their kids had made comments to the effect that they didn't think they needed to worry about their future or just that their life would be cut short. Um, and, you know, Tyler's accident was complete. It was a complete accident when a lady cut him off. So it wasn't, he didn't say that because he, he, he just, something in him felt that he wouldn't be here. And he was always in such a hurry, almost that was another sign. He was always in a hurry, wanted to do everything, get every moment he could. And I believe that it was because he knew his life, you know, a, a typical teenager sleeps in on the weekends and he was the first one up and he'd be out the door hiking. And again, I just, I believe wholeheartedly that he knew. With, I mean, not not his human self, but his soul, his soul knew. That's right, that's right. And, and many of you listening tonight who may be new to this will look back at things that were said and come to know, or perhaps dreams you had and come to know what many of us have had the experience of that the soul knows. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. All right. Irene Vuvalides, you are next in the book. Okay. All right. And your beautiful daughter, Carly, snagged me as I was reading this to have you share with us about your sister Judy's experience shortly after Carly passed that let her know in an amazing way that Carly was around. Um, my sister didn't, and many of you know Judy, and Judy was my lifeline in those early days and weeks after Carly passed. And Judy didn't leave my side for probably close to a week, I think, and finally had to go home and get some clothes and come back to the house. And what she relayed to me is that she said to Carly, please, Carly, give me something that I know you're here that I can give your mom some comfort, you know, just let me, let her know. And, um, my sister's cell phone and she showed it to me and unfortunately she lost the screenshot of it uh, something came up on her cell phone and it said heaven looks a lot like the mall and anyone who knew my daughter my daughter who loved to shop and loved to spend all of her free time at the mall so it would make sense that carly would hit the mall as soon as she crossed over now there's something that very important that you say in the same paragraph after telling that story. You say in that point in your grief, you would not have been able to recognize a sign if it hit you over the head. Would you share about that with everybody that might be new to this? Sure, I um, was in, as we all are in the beginning, such a terrible, dark, 
dark place in my grief that I did not want to be here. And my mind went to, I need to be with Carly. How am I going to leave this earth to be with her? And in my other voice would say, Tony's been widowed once. You can't have him be twice widowed. And it was just this going back and forth constantly. Um, and I'm sure she must have tried to reach out, but I would not be able to, to feel or to hear it from her. What was the first sign that you actually noticed then? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I really had a sign from her until after I had a reading, probably two readings and my reading with you. And then it just seemed like the signs just happened and they probably were happening, but I didn't see them. And the sign um, that's the one that I get so often is through music and the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow. All right. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, I hope Suzanne. that gives hope to all of you that, that say that I'm not getting any signs, that they come sporadically, not on a regular basis, and just at the right time. So don't give up hoping for that. Have Ernie and Christine uh, joined us this evening? They're here. They're, um, they need to unmute, though. Say hi. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Let me find your note. Here it is. Where are you guys? Well, we'll see you in just a second. Can you see so, <laughs> loved rereading all of these chapters, and I know Quentin's story because I've interviewed you on my show. It's good to see you. There you are. So, as I was reading that, Quentin drew my attention, snagged me with the section where he gave indicators that he was an old soul in a child's body. Why don't you talk to us about the concept of an old soul and how it applied in your specific case to Quentin? Quentin, um, he just, he looked at life differently. He, he was- More mature. Yeah, very mature, kind-hearted, and always supremely focused on making others feel better. Can we just stop you for a second and tell every, let you share with everybody how old Quentin was when he passed? Quentin was nine and a half years old when he passed. Okay. And uh, that's, it's been 12 years now. And, um, you know, Quentin demonstrated himself being an old soul to us. And we kind of took it for granted, but the things that really impacted us is what we heard afterwards uh, from others, from, from kids on the school bus who would indicate that he would come to them and protect them if a bully was bothering them or a teacher even who who shared that uh quentin was the only one who when he came to school for the new year he would he would go to his previous year's school teacher and give her a hug so that's i mean those are just a couple of examples but he was always just i mean one of the funnier stories is uh when when Christine and I would go out for an occasional date night and uh, our daughter who was six and a half years older and and he were alone they normally had a bit of a contentious relationship but when we were gone Quentin would take care of her our daughter Cheyenne which we we found pretty pretty hilarious <laughs> wise beyond his years definitely. definitely and you've worked with a lot of shining light parents I know it's not in every case, but what do you say about those who have children who pass and the old soul concept? Well, for me, I mean, and I, I'm, you know, I wasn't religious. I didn't know about anything. So as, as all of this was happening and unfolding, every epiphany just opened me wide. And I often, you know, almost immediately would say, you know, old soul indicates that they and uh, it's kind of funny for, because from the religious perspective, from Christianity, you know, you know the, the, the dogma about Christianity is reincarnation isn't real. Well, I, would, I'm, I always say, well, how does a child get an old eyes? How is a child born with an old soul? It's like, come on. <laughs> and, and that just, I mean, not to, not to run on and on and on, but you know me and many of you here know me. And it's, it's I just kind of come to us. 
if our child passes, transitions, and begins to send us signs, that's a clear indication that they're not dead. Um, I don't even like using that that word, the D word. It, it means that they're very much alive. I often say that people don't send signs. Um, and going down this path and reading everything I've, I've read over the years after, you know, recognizing, acknowledging all the signs, after talking to dozens and dozens and dozens of people who have received signs, I um, I just became acquainted with the concept of reincarnation. I'm going to say, and uh, dozens of books about reincarnation, and got to a point I could recognize in Scripture, in the New Testament, where they were referring to reincarnation. So to answer your question, um, finally, um, the old the old soul, the old eyes, as far as I'm concerned, uh, relates to a bit of reincarnation. Okay, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Good to see you. Good, Good to see you, you too. Thank you. All right, well, moving on. Next in the book is Jeff Olson talking about his son Griffin. Jeff couldn't be here this evening with us. The part that that Griffin snagged me with was how Jeff felt haunted with images of the accident that caused the transition of his son and his wife. He couldn't get it out of his mind until something happened. And what happened was Jeff had a near-death experience and found himself face to face with Griffin. You all will have to read the book to, to hear it in his own words, the way he wrote them. But it was just, there is nothing like that personal experience of seeing his child as he did. And many of you have this experience in your dreams. He had it in a near-death experience, which I don't recommend. And saw, here's my son, we're together. He felt his presence, saw his presence, they communicated and nothing can take away his awareness now that Griffin is still part of his life as are all of our kids. Uh, Kim Camacho wrote the next chapter about her son, Austin. I believe she is not able to be with us this evening as well. Is that right, Elizabeth? Yeah. Yes, she's, she's not here this evening either. She's unfortunately not able to. <clears throat> okay, well, let me just share briefly what I was gonna ask her to share about. And, and it's so important for those of you who are experiencing uh, compounded grief, or there may be other ways of saying it, but compounded challenges. Here she was going through the, that period right when you're just adjusting to the transition of a child, and yet at the same time, she lost her job or didn't work for six months. She lost her home. She had to file bankruptcy. All of these things piling up, and yet Thanks to her son, she says, she felt mentally strong, emotionally strong, and physically strong, thanks to the help of her son. What a difference that makes. So I was hoping she could join us and talk about how we're never given more than we can handle because we're given our kids to help us with it and our helpers in spirit, angels, guides, and the support of those who are joining you here tonight. So sorry Kim couldn't join us for that, but read the book. It's excellent, excellent chapter there. Okay, I know Kim Courtney's here. I saw you here a minute, so why don't you unmute yourself, Kim, while I pull up my little tab here. Are you here? Say yep, hello. I'm here. There you are. Hi, good to see you. Hey, you too. And you and your son Derek wrote your chapter. Yep. So he would like you to talk about dealing with the what ifs. Do you know what he means by that? If only I had done this, what if I had done that? All of the thoughts that come up afterwards. Right, so my son Derek um, was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. He suffered for over a decade with that disease before he transitioned. And I remember when he became when it was close to the end of his life here on earth, I would say, if I'd only take him to another doctor, if I'd only had him take this therapy, take this medication, what if it, it was what shoulda, woulda, coulda all the time. And after he transitioned, I still did that. Even though my logical self knew 
nothing would have made a difference. I did what I could and he left earth when he and God decided it was time for him to go home. It, so even though I prayed for a miracle and I knew God was going to give me this miracle, well, his miracle was that he transitioned and he got to go home and that he no longer had to suffer. So that was not my miracle, but it was his. So in the end of his earthly life here, God granted him the serenity that he could have peace, joy, happiness, and where he is now. What a beautiful way of looking at those thoughts. We get so stuck in one way of seeing things. How long did right. it take you to see it that way, Kim? Right. How long did that take you to get to that point? Oh my gosh. Well, it's been four years and probably 18 months, but I was busy with, he came to me three days after he transitioned and gave me my earthly job to continue on with his legacy. So I've been very busy with that. So I've not, I've tried not to spend so much time being a victim, being a martyr, but honoring him through the charity that in a dream, he came and told me about what the charity was, what I was gonna do, who was gonna help me. And we just four weeks ago had uh, the third charity event with 400 people there. It was so magnificent, so perfect. So what a lovely night to honor Derek, but not only Derek, the two young men that had lost their lives are firefighters um, to honor them. But all these moms and dads that are here with us tonight, they were there, their kids were there and guiding me through every step of this huge production. So I don't dwell too much on the shoulda, woulda, couldas because I know I did everything that I could to help him survive. But it was not about me and Derek, it was about God and Derek. Beautifully said. And I have to tell all of you that Kim had me laughing out loud in her chapter. She talks about the first time she went to a Helping Parents Heal meeting and she said, I knew I was in good company when she went there because she saw Elizabeth Boisson. Who's the other one that was there? Michelle Ziff. Michelle Ziff. She said yeah. they had their hair done. They were dressed <laughs> to the nines. I looked like something the cat dragged in. <laughs> and then this line here, I said to them, I'll have what you're having. <laughs> and you know, to be able to laugh at that moment, yeah. Kim, is a beautiful thing. She says, it was at that moment I knew I was going to be okay. Yep, that was that was it. I mean, I saw them eating, chatting, talking about their kids. I thought, geez, I got a ways to go, but I know I can get there. And that was two weeks after he passed away. And then the third week, I was at Carol Allen's house for my first Helping Parents Heal meeting. And at that meeting, I knew six of the parents because they were all clients of mine. So it's been an amazing, loving journey to be with these women and these men. And they've helped me beyond what they even know. Beautiful. They, yeah, yeah. And all of you can be in gallery view and look around at your soul brothers and soul sisters right here, because this is your tribe right here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right. So we're going to move on to Laurie Savoie. She's going to be talking about her son, Garrett. It's his angel anniversary today. So we honor Garrett and everybody today. But Laurie. Hi, Derek, everyone. Yeah, hey, there she is. <laughs> now, there's another Derek in the book, Derek Courtney. He also has a red balloon story, but your Garrett wants you to share yours. Look how you're wearing red tonight. So oh, yeah. Perfect. Cool. You didn't know wow. the question. Nobody knew what I was going to ask, but it's perfect. No. Um, okay. I'll try and condense it in a short time because it was one of those things. He passed away 11-17, which is today, his anniversary. So 
Hi, everybody. It's been an up and down day for me, even though it's 11 years later. So I'm doing great. I know where he is, but it's still emotions wave through you. And ironically, I was walking my dogs today and I thought of Suzanne and the yellow butterfly in the middle of nowhere in the sea. So it's amazing how things just pop into your head and um, comforting. That was comforting from Susan to me today. So nice. And anyways, he passed away, uh, transitioned 1117. And the, the, the next beginning of February, my nephew and niece and two young kids came to visit from Canada to our home um, to run a, mar a marathon. So I'm sure they coming to our house must have had trepidation thinking, what, what are we going to find when we go there? because they knew Garrett and, you know, it's, anyhow, the whole time they were there was really good, fun. The little kids were there. I was playing with them in the kitchen. They were at the island coloring and all that. And I was in the kitchen getting things ready because we had company. And my niece, my nephew's wife, says to me, okay, this balloon just came. I watched this balloon, red balloon, come from a different part of the house, came all the way over beside me at the island. And then it was like here and there. And she said, I, Lori, I think that's Garrett. And I, I look, I'm looking at the balloon. I said, okay, well, if it's Garrett, let's test. Let's see. I said, Garrett, can you go up to the ceiling? So the balloon went up to the ceiling, 12 foot high ceiling. And she's looking at me and I'm saying, okay, Garrett, awesome. Good job. Can you go to the floor? So down it goes to the floor and then it's here and it comes right around here. And my niece is saying to her husband, who's my nephew, Eric, look at this, this balloon is Garrett. And he is having no part of it, even though he has a brother transitioned on the other side, he did not believe at all. Anyhow, long story short, after this balloon doing this and that, it, he, it went, my nephew was around in the kitchen at a different part uh, logging into the computer to get their numbers for this race that was coming up in a day or two. Well, Garrett decided, took it upon himself in balloon form to go with his, my nephew, who is his direct cousin. So he left my side after going up and down and basically kind of performing circus tricks, I hate to say, but I had to prove it. I knew, I knew, but anyways, long story short, the balloon left me went to a different part of the kitchen and sticks itself at the side of my nephew's head. So my nephew is still typing on the computer. He's having nothing to do with this. The balloon goes around, around his head to the other side. Nope, he's ignoring it. So the balloon goes under his arms. Let me go back so you can see this. When he's typing, it comes under his arms and comes right up in front of his face. So now he can't even type on the computer. So my in the meantime, my niece, Carrie, is hysterical, saying, Eric, you have to, there's no way you can't believe it, and on and on. So Eric has this balloon stuck in his face, so he rolls with it, and he said, all right, all right, Garrett, if, you really, if this really is Garrett, go get me a beer. So the balloon comes out from under here, goes under his arm, goes out the door of the kitchen, turns left, goes down this long hallway, turns an angled corner, goes through the laundry room door. In the meantime, now we are all following this balloon and not one of us, we, not one of us thought to grab our phone and videotape. I do have that one regret, but we talk about being in the moment. So the balloon came all the way around, all of us like the Pied Piper following this red balloon. It was about three feet off the air, off the floor. It went into the laundry room, went to the drink fridge, suction cupped itself on there to the drink fridge, which Garrett was a 19 year old boy. He'd been in and out of that thing hundreds of times. So my nephew proceeded to say, all right, he opened the, he opened the fridge door, grabbed the beer, because he had said, if, okay, I think I said, go get me a beer, if Garrett, if that's you. So anyways, he grabs the beer, he closes the door. We're all looking. Man, he almost squished Garrett into the wall. <laughs> We're laughing about that. He opens it and he cheers in the air to Garrett. So he uh, he became a believer over a red balloon. 
And uh, on top of that, I didn't write in the book, that balloon lasted, that balloon went into his room. I hovered over his bed. I should have put this in the book for like four months. So I know without a shadow of a doubt, that was my son saying, hello, of course he would. His family was there from Canada visiting. So that is just so beautiful. And you know, even if you'd had videos of it, naysayers might say, well, somehow we were pulling with a string. So True. it doesn't matter. You had the witnesses and it's right there in your heart. And all Absolutely. of you who've had these kinds of experiences, you can have people try to talk you out of it. It doesn't matter. You know what you know. He really pulled out the stops for that one. So thank oh, you for yeah. sharing that. That's beautiful. And I just changed into a red shirt just before. <laughs> so love you, Garrett. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Hey, Garrett. All right. Well, after that, might seem hard to top that one, but Linda McCarthy, let's bring you on, please. You're next in the book. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. Nice Hi, everybody. to see you. It's so cool. I was so impressed, and Gar and, um, your wonderful son, Sean, snagged me with this story. It, it follows perfectly on the tales of what Garrett had us talk about this evening. It's another one of those magical moments that can't be explained with the laws of our physical universe. And that's, you will know what I'm talking about when I say the word luggage. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, um, and I'll make this very short, but- um, Take your time. Sean, we lived in Arizona for 15 years, fell in love with it, Sean loved it, would visit from college. And even after he became an officer in the Navy, whenever he could, he would come back, just loved it. So I never had any plans or desire to leave Arizona. And I remember my last hug from Sean um, before he left for his next duty station. And that was the last hug I received from him before he transitioned. So of course that was where I wanted to stay. Fast forward, we go to Florida. We have a, a place on the beach and a friend of mine said, have you ever thought about a little town called Venice? This was in Sarasota. I said, no, not really. So, well, let's just drive around and see what you think. Drove around, fell in love with it. A couple days later, my husband joined me. I said, well, just let's take a look. We drove into a community and my husband said, well, if I were to live here, I'd live on this street or this street. Long story, we ended up finding a house that day, put a bid on it. They accepted it the next day, bought the house. Didn't plan on it. I was just on vacation. So I knew I had three days to decide whether or not I wanted to keep that. Flying back to to Arizona, I said to Sean, if this is supposed to happen, then this house needs to sell quickly, like in a few days. So three days, it's sold. If I could just interrupt, I just love what you just showed everybody there, that you're talking to your son as you're doing it. It's not wondering, I, I wonder if he's upset about this or is he going to help me with this? You just right there, talk to him. It's I was like, Sean, if, if you want this to happen, this house has to sell in three days. Well, it did. It sold. So now I'm panicking. <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I know how much you love this house. And he had the casita. That was his room. I went into his room and I cried. And I said, I don't, I feel terrible for selling your house. I feel terrible. And he said to me, go to my luggage, look in my luggage. So I hadn't opened his luggage in years. Um, it still smelled like him. I didn't want to lose that. But I went to the back of the closet and pulled it out. I have to preface this by saying that when we bought the house, the house had already sold and it fell through. So there were only three brochures left. So they gave us one, the selling agent took one and our agent took one. So he says, look in my luggage. So I unzip his luggage and I look in the bottom and I see this crease and I pulled his stuff back and there's a brochure. Well, he had looked at property in San Diego. So I thought, well, maybe it was something he looked at. I opened it up and it was the exact house that we bought, the exact home. So 
I immediately was like, no, why did my husband put this in Sean's luggage? So now I'm mad. So I go, anybody else the- have goosebumps right now? <laughs> <laughs> so I go in the house. I said, why did you put this in Sean's luggage? And he said, what are you talking about? I don't even know where Sean's luggage is. So he goes to his briefcase, unzipped his briefcase. There is the brochure. Now I have a brochure and he has a brochure, but there are only three brochures. So that to me, I said, thank you, Sean. That was his confirmation to me that he was good to go with this house. And I feel him all the time. In fact, right before this, he sent me a message and let me know that, you know, he was here. And um, so he picked this house for us. I didn't pick it. He chose it. But it's, yeah. it's absolutely amazing. And, and the only explanation for that is that this world is not as solid as it seems. And certainly science is proving that. And at certain times, the rules of this universe are allowed to be broken so that those across the veil can show us in a miraculous way, which you're now sharing with, with people through the book in your story. So way to go, Sean. And I love way to go, Linda, for you hearing him say, look at my luggage and acting on it. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thank you you. so much. Thank you for allowing me to share. Yes, indeed. So Michelle Ziff, we have another Garrett. Are you with us here? Michelle here this evening, Elizabeth? Yes, she is. She's having trouble unmuting. Okay. I'm sure you can. Michelle, you should. And Suzanne, we also wanted to let you know that Nita and Glenn are here. They are. That's great. Yes. Good. Okay. So, Michelle, are you there? Yay. I just did it. Okay. I'm going to trust that you're here. As I reviewed your chapter, your Garrett snagged me with stories of connections across the veil here and there, so there's only here, but showing the web, for example, two different Garrett's and tattoos. You know what he's talking about? Oh yeah, yes. Um, my goddaughter, Becca, got a tattoo with his signature and it says, love Garrett. She got it on the back of her neck um, and it's beautiful. She was the first one of all, any of us that got tattoos for him. And I was, I had been going to Helping Parents Heal meetings for a while, but Lori was never there. I never met Lori before. So I went to, it was one at Carol's house, Carol Allen. Um, and it was, and I was, everybody goes around and they share their stories. And when Lori started talking, I immediately, there was something about her I, I loved. She's like funny without trying to be funny. And I just already felt a connection with Lori. So afterwards, um, you know, we talked to we talked to the other moms and we hang out much longer than we're supposed to because you know Tony wants us to leave. And anyway, um, so it, I'm standing next to Lori and she's talking to one mom. I'm talking to another, and she said, "My daughter got a tattoo today on her 18th birthday in memory of her brother." Now I don't even know Lori's. I didn't know she lost a son or a daughter. I didn't know anything about Lori. But something made me look as soon as she said that. And she showed the other mom a picture on her phone of the tattoo that says, Love Garrett. <laughs> and this one, my, my uh, Becca's was, in, it was in cursive. It was his handwriting was in cursive. And Chantel's was not. But it was the same handwriting that my Garrett had, had it not been in cursive. It was it, the exact same handwriting. And, and it was crazy. And they have done a lot of different things together um ever since then it's from across the veil from across the veil crazy things and a give whole us, other give us one story. more example um well i mean it's another balloon story if you if, if you want to hear that that then we we are in another group we were at a retreat and we did a lot of different things it was the last day and everyone wrote on a balloon a message to their to their child to to you know we were all going to set the balloons up to go up in the air at the same time. So Lori was so busy passing out, getting, you know, helping everybody else, she gave her balloon away. And um, so she now has no balloon because there were none left. So I already wrote on mine. I said, you know what, this will just be Garrett times two. So I wrote on my balloon, Garrett times two, and this was both of ours for our Garrett's. And everyone gets together and they all let the balloons go. 
And Lori and I are watching everybody else's balloons going up in the air, over the house, into the sky. And our garrets are still like two feet off of the ground, going onto the side of us, going around the house, and we're following it. She said, my garret never liked to follow rules. I said, do you think that mine did? And we're following this <laughs> balloon and it works, it, it works its way into the side of the house, all these bushes, it stopped in a bush. And I, I had this all on video actually, and it stopped in the bush and it was there for, I don't know, probably 30 seconds to a minute. And then it eased its way out of there, came out of the bush and then it finally went around up into the sky. But it was, it was way, everybody else was doing their own thing. It, it was crazy. <laughs> and, and, and there have been a lot of times, there, there are so many stories, but it just, it just proves that all of our kids bring us together. We're all in this group. And, and I really do believe that um, it, it's our kids that, that do it. They bring us all together to be able to help each other. And, and, and it, it's just an amazing thing that's happened. And it, I'm just, I'm happy I could be part of this. And, you know, I hope everybody reads the book. It's, it's a great book. And I'm just so, you know, proud to be part of it and honored. So thank you, thank you for letting me share. Not just the book, but this evening, I can just feel everybody soaking up everybody's story. It's so helpful, so healing. Let's move on to Lynn and Jeff Hollihan. Your Devon, who you wrote about so beautifully, like everybody else, shared that he wants you to talk about the I've been with them the whole time stories. I believe there are two examples of that. You can take no. the first one. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. no. All right. Uh, with them the whole time. So my brain is in a fog. You do it. <laughs> Which one you want to talk about first? This fog. <laughs> my okay. brain is not there. <laughs> You're talking about a friend who told you she'd been walking through the Prague Christmas markets. Okay, so yeah. the, the visions. Yeah, okay. Um, so earlier on in the presentation, you talked about old souls, okay? I'm not one. <laughs> <laughs> so this, you know, this, this whole thing has been quite an adventure. <clears throat> and I referred to it, you know, early on as, as being skeptical, being a non-believer and having to be smacked upside the head by a spiritual two by four numerous times. And this was one of the first blows. But um, Devin passed um, almost exactly 12 years ago. And uh, his date of passing was November 21st. And we spent most of the next month in Germany searching for him. He went missing. And then it was, it was exactly um, a month later that we found his body. So that takes us to Christmas time. So we had been home for a little less than a week and we were invited to a Christmas dinner at, uh, at the, the home of some extended family. And it was a very awkward meal. Uh, the subject of our son passing never really came up. So it was kind of painful and awkward. But after the meal, uh, Lynn asked me to read a, an email that we had gotten a couple of days prior to, uh, to Christmas. So I pulled out my phone and I'm reading and I'm trying to read through the tears. And, and the, the, uh, the note was from one of his teachers in Prague. He had gone, he had gone to Prague to get his certification as an English teacher through uh, teaching English as a foreign language. So one of his teachers wrote a letter and described the group, the 20 some odd kids that had really bonded well and partied together and studied together and traveled together and uh, all this sort of stuff. And then she went on to describe Devin's, what he brought to the table, his, his characteristics and, and uh, the energy that he brought to the group. And then she went on to say, oh, oh by the way, since I was a little girl, when a member of my family passed, I would have a vision. She said, I, I knew the difference. This wasn't a dream, it was a vision. It was very clear and I could remember every little detail. And she said, I had a vision about your son. 
And in that vision, she discovered, she, she described the Christmas markets in, in downtown Prague where we had just been. And she described the sound of the horse-drawn carriages clopping over the cobblestones. And she described the smell of the food that was cooking in the stands and the pine trees. And she described the music and the people. And she said, there was a crowd. And across the crowd, she saw Devin. She described what he was wearing, described the, the type of clothes, the, the backpack, the hat he was wearing. and he saw her at the same time so they came together and she said to him devon where have you been don't you know that that we've been looking for you and he said tell them i'm fine and that i've been with them the whole time and that was uh, that was kind of interesting but the the second part of that was even more amazing and and really was that two by four upside the head that i'm talking about because as I brush the tears out of my eyes, as I complete the story, I look across the table at my mother-in-law, Lynn's mom, who has the very, very interesting look on her face. And she turns to her husband, Lynn's stepdad, and says, would you read the letter that you got from, from your granddaughter a couple of days ago? And in this letter, his granddaughter, who Devin had met the previous year for the first time, admitted for the first time that she had visions too. And she had a vision of Devon. And in this vision, she described a medieval city. She had never been to Prague. So she described a medieval city, probably in Spain. She said the Christmas market was going on and she described the cobblestone streets and the smells of the food and the pine trees and the Christmas music playing and a crowd of people from which Devon emerged. And they came together again and she said, Devin, where have you been? Don't you know we've been looking for you? Once again, the response was, tell them I've been with him the whole time. So here's, and, and here's, so, yeah. here's two people across the world that don't know each other almost on the same night, have almost word for word the same vision. They did both described what he was wearing and the same thing, <laughs> you know, describe jeans, flannel shirt, backpack, and I mean, how can you deny yeah. any of that? And, and how we can check, you deny that? We check the dates, and even though they're half a world away, you know, allowing for time zones, they each had the vision on the same night. And the night that they described, we checked our calendar. It was the night we were in Prague at the, at the Christmas market. So, in fact, he, he, he had been there. Us. He was with us and had been the whole time. And this is why this story is so beautiful for all of you listening tonight, because your kids are with you, especially when you're thinking about them. So Devin was able to get his message through to two different people with, and with beautiful validations, and the message applies to everybody. We've been with you the whole time. So thank you, Lynn and Jack. We believe. Thank you. <laughs> Still right here. As you should. <laughs> Great fun. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Mark Ireland. Would you unmute yourself and say hello? You've got it. I Hi. guess I should turn the lights up a little. Can you see me all right? We see you just fine. Okay, great. So I know that, I hope most people listening have read some of your books and know about you and your dad and your, your, your father's history as an incredible psychic and medium. And you tell about it so beautifully in the book. And yet you share in the book about knowing about future events. Would you share with us about some of the future things that have come up that you shared in here? Um, if it's not specific to my father, one that- No, no, this, but this is from Brandon, yeah. Yeah, one, one that was pretty interesting, I think probably takes the cake. Uh, we have another medium friend, Molly Morningstar, some people may know her. And back in 2014 in January, she uh, was coming to Scottsdale and uh, we offered to put her up in our house. And so she was very grateful. And she said, well, I'd like to give you guys a reading as a gift for you know, letting me stay with you. And so we said, sure, that'd be great. So in the reading, I, I get some um, things from my mom, which were pretty funny things that, you know, that I knew about her. Um, so she was tuning in and then she had Brandon tune in. And she's, uh, now my older son, Stephen, was due to get married at a destination wedding in the Loire Valley of France in, in May of 2014. So 
Molly brings up this wedding and that Brandon's really ex about, excited about his brother getting married. And he said, you know, it's okay if another young man stands in as the best man, but he's the real best man. And uh, don't forget that. And uh, then she went on to say, and I, he's showing me something. It's like a, a memento or something that you pin on your, on your lapel. And I think it'll have a picture of Brandon. And I think Stephen will be wearing this at, on the wedding day. And uh, Stephen will be wearing a very nice suit, but not a tuxedo. Um, so remember 2 p.m. on the wedding day. So that's, again, January 2014. Fast forward to May, and it's the wedding day. And just shortly before the wedding, one of the groomsmen comes to me and he says, hey, Mark, I've got something for you. Um, it's a gift from Liz Rowe, who was a friend uh, back in Arizona that couldn't make the trip. And so she, he handed it to me. I opened it and the box is filled with these small framed pins with a picture of Brandon on them. And Stephen wore one, I wore one, and all the groomsmen wore one. And we still have those in the photos. Now you can see that pin on there. And uh, Stephen was in a nice suit. He was not in a tuxedo. And his mother discovered about these pins at 2 p.m. on the wedding day. Beautiful. So how about sharing with everybody the, the obvious lesson about how that happens? Well, there's really no time on the other side. <laughs> time is an artifact of the, the 3D or 4D world, if you want to call it, that we live in. Um, and so they, like you said, they have a broader view of this broader perspective. Past, present, future are all kind of one thing. I guess you could visualize it like they're up on the hill and they could see who's coming who's right in front of them and who, who already left that area. Something along those lines. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. All right. Next chapter in the book is Leanne Hall talking about her wonderful son, Andy. Welcome, Leanne. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Well, Andy snagged me with the words out of my comfort zone and wanted you to talk about that. And I feel a, a really nice direction to go with that would be based on your past uh, religious beliefs and how after his passing you were taken out of your comfort zone. It might help a lot of people here tonight. Yes, so um, Andy moved to heaven after he completed suicide when he was 16 years old. So our background is what most people would understand as a fundamental Christian, an evangelical Christian, very, very, lots of indoctrination, a lot of, uh, I read the Bible every morning, I prayed over my kids every day, summer camps, church camps, winter camps, you name it. I mean, my kids, we were immersed in our faith and that's how our family, how we raised our children. So when Andy passed, the first thing, one of the first things that came out of my mouth, when I went into the bathroom to, to reconcile that this had happened to me, I looked in the mirror and I said, I will praise you in the storm because I knew that my faith was based on a decision and not an emotion and that faith is really who we are is really determined by how we respond to something that drops us to our knees or drops us to the concrete. And this, of course, drops us all to the concrete. And so while my faith had always been my foundation, at that moment, I knew Andy was in heaven but I wanted more information. I wanted to know what heaven was like. What was my kid doing? What, uh, I just was craving more information. And so in that, my religious indoctrination, my foundation, it's a definite no-no to explore the spiritual realm, to seek a medium, to do anything like that. And I received a couple messages from some random people and they said um, that I needed to see a medium in Carefree. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to hell if I go see a medium. So, you know, that certainly, I had to block that out right away, but that, that pulled at me. And so I Googled the medium that they were talking about so that I could find out that, you know, her background and she had a good background. She was in HR. She, I think her father was a minister and I thought, well, maybe I can squeak by since her father was a minister. So I did go see um, Suzanne Wilson 40 days after Andy passed. And it was a really big turning point for me 
to begin the process of peeling off the layers of my religious onion. And the thing that stuck with me at the end of that first reading was Andy saying t- to me, through Suzanne, my mom is tough as nails. She's going to be fine. And I walked out of there and I thought, I'm going to live every day to prove that kid right. And it was so disconcerting for me because it went against every everything that I'd been raised with and, and everything that I knew. And I was afraid that I would go to hell. I, it did scare me. And so I, I proceeded cautiously and I didn't tell anybody, but I knew I had to keep searching. And so I did. And it took me a couple of years to really blend my my faith based with my spiritual growth. And now it's just a beautiful picture. And I feel at peace with the whole journey, but it was a, it was a long journey. And it's ongoing and you're helping so many people. So thank you, Leanne. And thank all of the contributors to this book for going beyond their comfort zone and sharing the worst days and moments and times of their lives with everyone else so they could heal. It's just beautiful. All right, I understand Nita and Glenn Erickson were able to join us. Come on in. We are here. Hi, there you are. Hi, nice to see Hi. you. So your son, Kyle, as I was reading, he says, talk about siblings. And we understand that his brother had an experience that made the journey a little easier. A lot of people listening tonight have children still here in physical form that may need a little convincing this is real. Uh, it was about two weeks. It was two weeks after Kyle's accident and Ethan, he came out of his bedroom uh, extremely upset. He was shaking, he was crying. And he said, I have something to tell you. And he said that day, the morning that we found out Kyle had passed, we we were in the car on the way to the hospital with our pastor who wanted us to see Kyle in the hospital and not see him at the morgue. So we're in the car on our way to the hospital. And once we get there, we're taken into the chapel and we're waiting for the doctor to come in and explain to us how they tried to save Kyle. And we're, we're waiting and eventually he came in and we were able to go and see Kyle before they took him. And what Ethan was trying to tell me, or he did tell me was that when we were driving to the hospital, Kyle was riding his motorcycle alongside of our car. And he went all the way to the hospital with us. And then Ethan said that When we were in the chapel waiting for the doctor to come in, that Kyle was standing in the doorway of the chapel looking in at us, holding his motorcycle helmet with a very sad look on his face as he looked in at us waiting. And Ethan, none of us knew anything about mediums or signs or we all we were, were Christians and so we believed in heaven, but beyond that, we knew really nothing. And Ethan, after he told me, he didn't want to talk about it and he didn't for years. And Elizabeth asked me if he would allow this to be shared in the book. And I, I went to him and he said, yes, he was ready. Nice. But why did he wait the two weeks to share that with you? I don't think he, understood what had happened. Um, He was 18 years old and for him to have seen that, I'm sure it just completely confused him. And I don't think he could come to grips with it. I think it took him two weeks. I think he was afraid, maybe I would think he was crazy. Yeah, okay. Glenn, anything you want to add or anything anything about siblings? Oh, maybe not about siblings, but for me, I'm, I was always a skeptic of all this stuff. And then all the stuff that we've experienced, 
Ethan experience, uh, I had become a true believer too. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, it's just, again, like I said, after Leanne's account there, it's, it's courageous of all of you to share these stories here. They're very, very healing and we thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Let's see, next in the book is Jason Durham's story. He talks about Bailey. He couldn't be with us here tonight, but I hope that all of you will read his chapter. He talks about purpose. His daughter had uh, quite a few disabilities and he was her caregiver throughout her life. She was nonverbal and, and non-mobile, and yet he had a tremendous sense of purpose. And it's a very, very heartwarming, motivating chapter. So please do read that. Doris Norwood, welcome to the evening. Hello. Hello, there you now are. Now that I'm unmuted. There you are. How about sharing some of your favorite penny stories as a medium pennies don't come up as often as people might think. Not everybody finds pennies or has penny stories, but you have some outstanding ones thanks to uh, your daughter and your granddaughter in spirit. Um, they're very clever. They're very, um, they know it makes my heart smile. I miss them obviously so very, very much. Um, the cause of their death was uh, because they were killed by a drunk driver. So unlike some of the other parents, they did not, they, they weren't, neither one were old souls, neither one had ever, had ever given any indication uh, that they didn't think they'd be forever. Haley thought she'd be a rock star, so. Um, but as far as the pennies, um, there, <clears throat> when I say this, and I know it's gonna sound like it can't be true, but if you can, if you can think of a chest I have a chest full of pennies. Um, now I have to I, stop for a second here, Doris. Are you not the legal counsel for helping parents heal? I am. So I, I know that you know about telling the truth and nothing but the truth, right? Girl Scout honor. <laughs> you have a so, chest full of pennies. I do. And and I, I, I will tell you what what is so special about them. Uh, my daughter, Wendy, uh, Apparently, we all liked the movie Ghost, okay? And, you know, where Demi Moore slides the penny or whoever. And so I think the penny was sort of a connection that my daughter and granddaughter thought they would use for me. So a penny. Where we, took the, we took the grandchildren, my husband and I took the grandchildren to Europe. And we are, we get off the, the tour bus because you can't walk on the Vatican and not going to drop you off at the door. And so we're walking and we're walking single file. And the other thing I have to say is the pennies tell me that they're there. I'm not looking for pennies there. Okay. So anyway, we're walking along and I said to my son-in-law, I said, Charlie, there's a penny on the street. Again, we're at the Vatican. And he goes, there's a lot of, lot of traffic and and he says, he says, well, I'll get killed if I go for the penny. And I said, whatever it takes, Charlie, I need to get that. It was a U.S. penny. Okay, we went to Mexico a couple of times and there's a blowhole and I don't remember which city it was in. Twice, two separate visits, we're walking down a dirt path to get to this blowhole. Two pennies each time. Just a lot of pennies. And I will tell you that Sometimes I'm, I'm almost um, not afraid, but I, I'm cautious because people say, well, I never get a penny. Never, I never get a penny, I never get a penny, and I have a chest full. Again, Girl Scout honor. So that's the story with the pennies. They're very loving. Sometimes a dime and a quarter, but usually a penny. And the penny that's the most important one, I think, the first one, my other granddaughter is a dancer. We're at a, we're at a theater in Phoenix called the Herberger. We're at backstage. Um, I'm telling my husband that we're there safely. I go into this empty dressing room and I see just a piece of look like a penny. I pull it out with my, with my finger. I take it to my daughter because I can't read it without glasses on and my surviving daughter. And I said, Ronnie, I just, I've just found a penny. She goes, mom, it's 1994. That was the year Haley was born. So a lot of those beautiful stories and 
and they absolutely are with us all the time. They sure are. And thank, thank you for you. sharing that. And the line that you said there really stuck out to me, the pennies find you. They do. Yeah, it's beautiful. As do the butterflies, the dragonflies, the hummingbirds, the, whatever it is. They, <laughs> All those they find you, they grab your attention because your kids and spirit, any of your loved ones who have passed, are grabbing your attention with their minds and saying, pay attention, notice this now. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, Brian and Ty Smith, thanks for your patience. I know we've gone a little over the time, everybody, but this is a special event and everybody, we want to have, they, we want them to have their time and boy, it's just lovely to hear the stories so your journey with Shana is told so beautifully in the book but Brian you say that you were studying a word that may be new to some people when they read the book years before you went down this path thanatophobia will you talk about that and Ty would you just join in any any way you can contribute to that topic uh, yeah, for me, I, I started studying the afterlife probably, well, 30 years ago at this point. I, I had a, 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 an intense fear of dying, an intense fear of sudden dying, actually, from the time I was around age Shana was when she passed, uh, which caused me to have panic attacks and everything. So I started studying the afterlife to make myself feel more comfortable as to what this was all about, what happens, why are we here, all those types of questions. So the, uh, the good thing, the fortunate thing when Shana passed, and I, I will speak for myself and I'll let Ty speak for herself. You know, for, for a lot of us, it's like, where are they? Or do they even still exist anymore? Because we, even though we might go to church and we believe in heaven and stuff like that, we don't really know. Um, that was one thing I didn't have to go through. I, I always knew that Shana was, was, was still fine, was better than we are. Um, and I, I, so I, I did have that, that kind of advantage, I guess. And I, I, as I look back at my life now, I think that was put in my life to prepare me for her passing. And Shane also kind of gave us little clues is that, that she wouldn't be here for a very long time. So I'll let Ty talk about that. Yeah, I, um, where Brian started studying years ago, I wanted nothing to do with talking about death or hearing or you know whatever i just i didn't want to have anything to do with that i uh, let myself believe that um it was only old people that passed and and you know and and our, of course our kids would outlive us so one of the things i think shana's death has done for me is it it sent me on a um just crazy reading and trying to find out everything i could and one of my first uh, books was Suzanne's, one of Suzanne's books, uh, Messages of Hope, that just opened me wide up to believing in signs, looking for signs. And we started getting some things early on that uh, just helped me to understand that Shana was not really gone, that she was still here with us and that we would see her again. And so uh, I just, I believed her passing helped me uh, in that way and preparing me for, you know, that things don't always go the way we planned. But um, I've been grateful for every moment um, that we've been able to experience with all the wonderful people on here since Shana passed. And she has, she's just sent us some amazing signs and um, she's come through to her sister to us. So that, that's been a blessing to us also. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. I believe we've gotten through everybody who's contributed a chapter, except I would be very remiss if we didn't thank Zoe Carpertian. I believe I'm saying her last name correctly. I hope so. And she and her beautiful daughter, Kiara. She couldn't be here with us this evening, but she did a masterful job of editing all the stories. They flow beautifully. It's a very professionally done book. And so Zoe, we're all grateful to you for your efforts. I Could just I wanna... possibly, Suzanne, just ask you a quick question about Susan, <laughs> because you have a chapter in the book and we haven't been able to hear anything about Susan. Is it possible to do that? Just, I would just encourage people to, to read the chapter. And I thank Ty for mentioning my book, Messages of Hope, Susan's stories in there. And there's so much out there that I just want to focus on everybody else tonight. But thank okay, you. that's fine. There, yeah. It's a beautifully written chapter, though. But thank yeah. you. Well, I just want to wrap this up uh, before we're going to do the drawing, so don't go away. We have some names of people who are going to win a prize tonight. But uh, 
my guides just shared with me recently you have a wonderful list in the back of the book I, I believe Elizabeth put it together of the 10 how to heal from the passing of a child 10 beautiful steps that you all should check out because it's very very insightful but I'm from here on going to be sharing with people what I call the three E's to moving forward from loss and this book addresses the first one so beautifully the three E's are educate yourself educate yourself about the afterlife about what your kids are experiencing now then experience expanded states of consciousness the second E experience those so that you can connect directly with those who have transitioned and you do that through meditation and other practices and then the third one is engage you've seen examples this evening of the parents who are talking to their kids and I know you all are doing that but I want you to know they hear you so engage them when you have those visions when you wake up from a dream when you saw them talk to them they hear you so educate yourself that's an ongoing journey experience expanded states so that you can meet your kids in the middle and engage anyone who shows up in those adventures and consciousness because these contacts are real i want to thank all of you for letting me uh, moderate this evening it's always always an honor to share with all of you elizabeth you so do that we, drawing? Yes. Can we move on to the drawing then? I, I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt. You have the names beside you, I believe. And this is really exciting. Because, um, and lucky winners are going to win two books a piece. So um, even if you aren't present, you can still win because this is recorded. So it'll be easy to find the people who... Uh, so if you are a winner, if you are called, please email me at elizabeth at helpingparentsheal.org and I will get those books sent to you right away. So, so you I just want me to do 10 in a row, right? Yes, 10 okay. in a row. Um, and not too fast so that I can write them down. <laughs> okay. It's recorded. I pulled two at once. We have just plain Bobby is the name, Bobby. Bobby. I E, Bobby. Okay. And Lisita. Okay. L I S I T A. That's two. Here comes another one. Glenn D. G L E N N D. Okay. Conrado and Leslie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yay. okay here's one i believe is an email address maybe not a name affluent amore matchmakers <laughs> that <laughs> intrigues me <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's five okay here we go all right N. Cottrell, C-O-T-T-R-E-L-L. -L. You ready? Yes. This is seven. Daisy Hernandez. Okay, one. Oh. <laughs> and number eight, Claudia Edge. Can you hear people cheering? <laughs> yeah. I think they can. Right. Everyone's muted. <laughs> number nine, Marie. Okay, number nine. And finally, drum roll, please. Number ten, Angie H. Angie H. Okay, great. That's Yay. one. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's perfect. And congratulations to all the lucky winners. Just get in touch with me and let me know so that I can get those books out to you. I will need a home address to be able to do so. 
Um, but other than that, nothing else, as well as your last name, if it's just a first name <laughs> or just a first initial. But anyway, thank you all for being here. And I am so appreciative of you, Suzanne, for being the moderator. And you're right, it will be wonderful for everyone to read your chapter about Susan, as well as your foreword, which is incredible. And um, I think that Irene has probably unmuted everyone. Yes. Yeah. yes. So please unmute yourself and say thank you and good night. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.